Good evening, dear friends of Astronomy on Top London, and welcome to all the new people who are joining us today for the first time. Thank you for tuning in uh, to this new Stay at Home episode of Astronomy on Top London, and I'm hosting the event with Corentin today. Hi, Corentin. <laughs> Hello. I hope there are clear skies above you, because tonight is super moon night. Uh, and this means that the moon appears brighter and, and bigger uh, due to our satellite uh, being in perigee and in full moon phase. So if you are, and if you're watching us from Australia or the western parts of the Americas, you may likely enjoy a, a lunar eclipse too. Uh, talking about space objects that are very close to us, uh, well, actually, today we're not going to move away from Earth, uh, as we will focus on what we can do on our planet to prepare for future missions to Mars. And But before introducing our guest, uh, I would like to remind you that we'll have a Q&A session after the talk, so please post your questions in the YouTube chat, even during the talk, if you have any. Um, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to follow us on our social media here uh, to keep up to date with the next events. But let's now welcome uh, Dr. Laura Bettiol. Uh, she's a very special and uh, unusual guest, if you want. Uh, so we are uh, very excited to have her with us tonight. Uh, Laura is a, an aerospace engineer now working near Vienna, um, but she's completed her PhD in, in Padova in Italy. She um, works um, in this industry, uh, Laura, uh, and research, but she's also involved in the activity um, in the activities of the Austrian Space Forum or OEWF, which is going to talk about tonight. So Laura, we are curious to know what you do as main job as a, and as a volunteer for the Austrian Space Forum. So hello everyone, first of all. <laughs> um, yes, so um, I got a um, PhD um, in Italy and then I moved to Vienna uh, where I now work as a researcher and project manager at Fotec. It's a research company where we um, develop uh, electric uh, thrusters for satellites. Uh, so besides this, I also volunteer for different organizations, among which uh, the Austin Space Forum, uh, which is called ÖVF in short. And uh, um, here uh, I, I joined this uh, organization in uh, 2017, um, where I attended the analog mission basic training course and at uh, in 2018 I joined the first mission uh, in the flight planning team. So yeah, I am now deputy team lead of uh, this team and yeah, I enjoy very much uh, this, uh, this activity, this side activity that I do uh, in my free time and yeah, I'm looking forward to talking with you about this. <laughs> and we're looking forward to hearing about it. So yeah, you are involved in, in yeah, many, many activities. And yeah. actually, there is a fun fact that I would like to tell you about Laura and me. So we kind of met uh, for the first time almost 20 years ago. And because we were both going to a um, youth center, which had headquarters everywhere in, in Italy. I was living in Southern Italy and, and she was living in, in the North. Um, and there was a mon monthly journal, I think, where members of the center could uh, also add their home addresses in case they wanted to make new pen friends. And yeah, this is how we started as, as pen friends. And since then, we have always been in contact. And yeah, then we met uh, for the first time in person after six years from the first letter. <laughs> and here we are today, yeah, after so many years. <laughs> yeah, with the same passion for space. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. So, so uh, before starting, as you know, we post uh, quizzes and yeah, little games on our social media before the event. Uh, and Corentin is going to summarize this week's uh, questions for you. Feel free to post your answers uh, in the chat, and then we'll give the the final answer um, uh, after right after the talk. So, Corentin, the screen is yours. Yes, uh, 
So, um, so th this time we had two two questions on our social medias, and if we are if you are not already following us, either on Twitter or on Facebook or Instagram, uh, well, do it. Uh, you can also follow us on YouTube so that you don't miss any of the videos. Uh, the first question that we posted was which of the following environments are suitable for analog missions on Earth? Um, so the possible answers are the Arctic, the desert, your living room, or all of the above. Um, so uh, send your preference or the, the one you think is, is the, the best uh, answer uh, in the chat, uh, either down there or down there, I always get confused. Um, and then we had the second question, um, which is what are analog missions? Um, are they, uh, uh, well, missions that use analog? Uh, are they missions uh, of space before the di digital age or are they uh, space simulations here on Earth? Um, so again, post your um, answer to the chat or on Twitter or anything, or send it uh, to us, and and we'll answer them at the end of at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Corentin. I think that the first answer answer was actually um, missions that use analog devices, right? Oh, they, but well, anyway, <laughs> you can check also our social media. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, well, Laura. Uh, Yep. We could start when you're ready. Okay. So, Perfect. Yeah, good. So thank you very much um, to everyone to be here. And uh, also Kara and Corentin for your nice introduction. So uh, differently from the previous talks that were uh, given during this uh, um, series of events, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, something that's not uh, strictly about astronomy, but is more related to space exploration and what we can do here on Earth to prepare for the future missions to Mars. So let's start with an overview of the Austin Space Forum. Um, it's a citizen science organization that was founded in 1998, where not only space professionals, but also people with a passion for space work together on several activities. Uh, very often, uh, these are in collaboration with both national and international research institutions, with industry and with politics. Currently, the members of the organization are approximately 240. Uh, they come from different uh, countries, not only from Europe, but a few of them uh, also from other continents. The first activities that I want to mention are the analog missions for which the Austin Space Forum is very well known worldwide and uh, that are the topic of this talk. I will go more into details about this later. Uh, we also do uh, hardware development and uh, among many other activities, uh, the Austin Space Forum developed the AUDA and Serenity spacesuit simulators that are used uh, during our analog missions. Uh, since last year, the OVF uh, members uh, are also working on the other one, CubeSat, uh, which will be launched later this year thanks to collaboration with the company Spire. The OVF offers also student uh, internships, uh, supervises graduate, uh, graduates at uh, universities, and enables the participation in research and development projects. And last but not least, the Austin Space Forum also organizes uh, outreach events to inspire the new and also not so new generations with uh, hands-on uh, activities, with uh, water rocket competitions, and so on. But um, what is this analog research and why is it so important? Why are there so many organizations, uh, including space agencies, that are carrying out uh, these analog missions? So here you can see two photos. Do you see many differences between them? Can you easily recognize which one is, uh, uh, was taken on the Earth and which one was taken on Mars. <laughs> so, um, the first one, <laughs> I give you the answer, uh, was taken in a desert here um, on Earth. Uh, it was taken in Oman during uh, an analog mission of the Austin Space Forum. 
The second one was taken by NASA's uh, Mars Exploration Rover to Opportunity on Mars. They are quite similar. Huh? <laughs> so um, they have something in common. And you can clearly see they are um, isolated and quite hostile environments. So going back to our analog research and the analog missions. Um, so the word analog comes from ancient Greek and stands for similarity or likeness. In particular, uh, the people who conduct uh, analog research in the context of Mars look for similarities between the Earth and the red planet. Uh, we do analog research to prepare for uh, future space missions to the moon, to Mars, to the asteroids. And we do it here on Earth because it's cheaper and it's faster uh, than trying everything out in space beforehand. Several aspects of these missions are tested during these simulations from operation and communication. And this is related, for example, to, to the time delay, which um, uh, we have between uh, uh, Mars and the Earth, to uh, psychological aspects and human factors. For example, these are aspects related to isolation, to confinement, uh, to distance from other humans and also to test new equipment and new technologies. Um, and these are, for example, rovers, drones, and so on. But um, so what are these, uh, what are suitable environments to conduct analog missions? In these photos, you can see just a few examples of analog missions and their habitats. There are many others out there. On the top left corner, you can see uh, Crew 16 of NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, in short, NEMO. The Aquarius habitat that you can see in the background is located underwater, uh, some miles off the coast of Florida. The second picture on the top right corner uh, shows the Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation Habitat, uh, high seas which is jointly operated by NASA and by the University of Hawaii at Manoa. This habitat is located on an isolated position on the slopes of the volcano Mauna Loa. So we have an underwater habitat, one on top of a volcano. And then uh, on the bottom left, we have the crew, um, a crew in the plant cultivation chamber of China's Lunar Palace One. This is a self-contained laboratory in Beijing. And then on the uh, last picture on the right, um, we have the crew of Mars 500, which was a cooperative project between ESA and the Russian Institute for Biomedical Problems. Uh, this crew spent more than 500 days in an isolated, isolated facility in Moscow. Uh, as you can see, uh, the analog missions are not only conducted in the desert, but uh, also in other environments, uh, from the mountains to the sea, glaciers, also Antarctica, and, um, and also in special enclosed facilities like these two uh, on the bottom here. What they have in common is that uh, they are isolated and confined, and they give this isolation and confine confinement experience to the analog astronauts. Um, however, uh, the analog space research did not start just recently. Uh, in the picture, you can see the two um, Apollo 15 astronauts, James Irwin and David Scott, uh, while doing some geology training in the desert in New Mexico. So this was already a few decades ago <laughs> before the moon missions, Apollo 15. Um, now I will shortly talk about the, uh, our spacesuit simulators. Um, Auda X is the first generation of the advanced spacesuit simulator for future human Mars missions of the Austin Space Forum. Uh, this prototype was developed between 2009 and 2018 and emulates the restrictions of uh, an actual planetary surface spacesuit like uh, weight, resistance to movements, or limited sensory input. At the same time, 
Uh, this spacesuit simulator protects the analog astronaut from the um, outside environment and keeps them alive. It provides an advanced human-machine interface, including a sensor network and a specifically developed software that assists the astronaut or the analog astronaut during planetary surface operations and collects biomedical and technical telemetry and sends it back to Earth. Uh, the suit uh, weighs about 50 kilos and has been developed to optimize interactions with other robotic components like a rover and minimize the risk of biological contamination of the surrounding environment. Uh, the space simulator has been used uh, during all the most recent analog missions of the Outer Space Forum. Currently, uh, a team of volunteers at the Austin Swiss Forum is uh, developing the successor of the AUD spacesuit uh, simulator, which is called Serenity. This uh, second generation spacesuit simulator mimics the restriction and technical aids which are expected for a Mars spacesuit in two or three decades. The main difference with the previous one, the AUD uh, spacesuit simulator, is the fact that uh, um, it has a rear entry concept. It's based on the uh, rear, uh, rear entry concept. Uh, so that the analog astronauts are entering the uh, spacesuit simulator from the back. Um, this brings two main advantages. On one hand, the sand and dust stay outside the habitat. And on the other hand, the time that is needed to put on the spacesuit simulator can be reduced to about uh, 50%, uh, compared with the time that is needed for, the, for wearing the AUDA spacesuit simulator which is approximately three hours. So now that we talked about analog research, about uh, analog missions and the space simulator, I'll give you uh, an overview of the analog missions of the Outer Space Forum. The first analog missions date back to 2006. Uh, since then, uh, several missions took place in many different places. Uh, those that are shown in the slide are examples of uh, large missions that uh, um, fr from the last 10 years. In 2011, um, we had the Rio Tinto mission. It was a six day mission in the Rio Tinto region in the south of Spain. Then uh, here on the right side, um, we have the uh, picture from uh, the Dachstein mission which took place in 2012 uh, in the Mammoth Cave and the giant ice cave in Upper Austria. Then in 2013, uh, there was a mission in Morocco uh, and this was the first long duration mission that lasted one month. The next one was Amadi 15. This uh, uh, also took place in Austria on a glacier and uh, lasted about two weeks followed by the Amadi 18 mission, which was uh, the Austin Space Forum last mission that took place um, uh, in February 2018. It was also a one month uh, uh, mission and uh, it took place in uh, the Dofar region in Oman. So here you can see some nice photos for, uh, from our last mission. Um, on this picture, you can see that uh, how the uh, analog astronauts were uh, driving around the field with uh, quad bikes and tracked vehicles. Uh, they, they needed them to go from one place to the other, uh, for example, to carry out some experiments. And uh, uh, here on the right side, you can see the habitat that um, uh, they had in, uh, in Oman. And um, on the bottom left corner, you can see one of our analog astronauts, um, Carmen, and two experimenters. They were two young Omani students who designed one of the experiments that uh, was uh, conducted during the mission. Um, here you can see some uh, examples of uh, the experiments that um, uh, took place uh, uh, during that mission. Uh, in total, they were um, approximately 18, if I remember correctly. And um, they uh, consisted, for example, of a drone, uh, which was used to uh, collect aerial images of the area. Uh, then there was a rover uh, that was also used to collect data of the surrounding environment. Uh, then there was uh, an experiment that was uh, used to study the presence of water through the reflection of ultrasound waves. And for example, there was also um, a greenhouse 
with hydroponics that was used for the cultivation of microgreens that were used uh, that as <laughs> food <laughs> at the end of the mission. <laughs> Uh, but the analog astronaut um, would not be able to conduct a mission by themselves. They need a support team behind, um, which is located at the Mission Support Center in, uh, in Innsbruck. In this slide, we have uh, Mars on the left and uh, the Earth uh, on the right side. Uh, all the communication and the data transfer between uh, the two are delayed by 10 minutes. Uh, to simulate the delayed communication between the two planets. Uh, regarding the Mars side, uh, we have uh, here in the, um, in the picture, the, um, on the top right corner, the five analog astronauts who were selected in 2015. Uh, those on the bottom left corner are, um, uh, is the class of uh, 2019. And after their selection, they uh, undergo several trainings to learn how to safely operate the spacesuit simulators, to uh, learn how to operate all the scientific experiments that uh, they need to perform during the mission, all the, they need to know all the procedures, all the communication methods, and how to repair the equipment, and so on. On the um, Earth side, uh, we have the mission support teams. Uh, I will just mention a few uh, with the respective roles. So for example, we have the flight control team, uh, which is led by the flight director, um, who makes decisions on the Earth side. Then we have uh, Earthcom, which is the only person, person on Earth who communicates directly with Mars. We have uh, biomedical engineers who check the medical data um, of the analog astronauts that uh, gets uh, transmitted from Mars. Then we have the remote science support team that takes uh, care of the experiments, knows their procedures and the data that is expected to be collected. And last but not least, there's also my team, the flight plan team. Uh, that plans the main activities and experiments in the field. And basically, um, we tell the field crew who has to do what, when, and where. <laughs> uh, what's next? So the next mission will be Amadi 20. It was uh, originally scheduled to take place in October 2020, but uh, due to the pandemic, it was uh, postponed to, to October 2021. It will last uh, slightly less than one month and will be based uh, in the Negev Desert uh, in Israel. In, and it will um, uh, it is in collaboration with uh, DMARS and the Israel Space Agency. Uh, approximately 20 experiments have been selected to be carried out uh, during this uh, mission. And here in this picture, you can see some, uh, in the slide, you can see some pictures, uh, the um, patch of the mission and some hashtags that you can use to follow the mission uh, in October. So yeah, this is the end of the presentation. Um, with this, I just wanted to give you a sneak peek of the activities that the VF does. Um, if you're interested in more details, please feel free to ask me um, and to follow our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation and now I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Laura. That was a super interesting presentation. Yeah, a lot of stuff that I would like to know more about. Um, but before the questions, I'll give the word to Corentin to give the answers. Uh, yes. Uh, so, well, all all the answers uh, of the two questions that I that I asked before were, of course, in in the presentation. So the first one was. Uh, what are, um, uh, in which environments are suitable for analog missions on Earth? Uh, so we had the choice between the Arctic, desert, your living room, or all of the above. Um, so Laura, can you comment on how you can conduct a, an yeah. analog mission in your living room? <laughs> yeah, so it's a little bit stretched <laughs> as an answer, but um, if you want to simulate, for example, the confinement and uh, isolation from other people, you can do it also from your living room. You just yeah. lock yourself up. So, yeah. Laura, I'm 
I'm currently in quarantine, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm qualified to conduct <laughs> a mission here yeah. <laughs> in, my, in my apartment. Fantastic. Correct. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And the, and the second question was, uh, what are analog missions? Um, oh, okay. I, oh yeah. I, that, that use uh, analog devices. <laughs> yes. Um, I corrected it twice and made my, my presentation crash. Uh, okay. Well, sorry. So it's supposed to be written that use analog devices, um, uh, or, but anyway, the, the right answer is space simulation here on earth, uh, which you presented uh, extensively. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me stop sharing then. And yeah, and now we will uh, take questions. So if you have any question, just feel free to ask uh, and we'll, and we'll trans transmit them. I have a question myself in the, in the meantime. Um, so how do you select the um, analog astronauts for the missions? Okay, so uh, there's a very tough selection process in place. Um, which uh, takes uh, into account many different variables. It goes from psychological aspects to physical uh, fitness. And um, for example, uh, there's also the um, um, requirement of being able to wear the spacesuit and to work with it, the analog spacesuit, and to work with it. Because, you know, uh, wearing for a few hours, 50 kilos of uh, uh, space it simulator <laughs> it's not so easy so um, yeah some of the, um, the, the usually there are many uh, uh, many many candidates um, who apply for becoming analog astronauts but only a few make it <laughs> it's a really tough selection process yeah, and then the the training that you mentioned uh, yeah. how long um does it last usually? Um, so for example, the um, uh, analog astronauts, uh, the last class uh, that was selected um, was in 2019 and the mission was scheduled to be last year. So um, it's actually quite um, uh, compact, but um, um, let's say, it happened, these trainings happen many uh, weekends a year or, um, yeah. And for example, not only for the analog astronauts, but also for the um, other uh, people who are uh, involved in the mission, uh, there are some trainings uh, during the year. And uh, uh, for example, for the flight plan team, uh, we have um, some specific trainings. Uh, there are specific trainings for the other teams as well. and. Um, we uh, keep uh, in contact with each other uh, by um, having a, a monthly meeting, for example, in my team. Um, yeah, so there's always something new to learn. Um, every uh, mission is a little bit different from the previous one. So there is always some updates and uh, uh, new experiments uh, that we need to learn. Uh, to, to know and uh, pr new procedures, uh, new people. It's uh, a, a very long process. Thank you, Laura. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Corentin, would you like to take the first one? Uh, yeah, we, we have a first question by uh, Mr. D. Brown, uh, who's asking what future emissions are being planned. Yeah, um, yeah, I mentioned it before. There's this uh, AMA D20 uh, that is happening in uh, October. And for now, that's it. <laughs> this is the next step step for, for us. What, what, what kind of experiments are, uh, are they going to do? Mm, there will be many different ones. Um, but as usual, there are some technical experiments with uh, uh, drones and uh, copters and uh, then we have uh, rovers and uh, psychological experiments many of them yeah these are basically uh, happening in most of the missions and Laura another follow-up questions you conduct a selection process for the experiments that are going to be carried out during the yeah. mission 
Correct. So uh, before each mission, uh, we carry out a selection process uh, where uh, we have an announcement uh, of opportunities for um, experiments and different uh, institutions um, can submit their proposals and then different teams, um, different teams analyze them and uh, based on different criteria, for example, feasibility on the technical side, um, on the um, time, also on the time availability side, let's, let's say if, uh, if an experiment lasts too long, <laughs> it's a bit complicated or um, it needs to be discoved maybe. Um, for example, also some, some of them are uh, too heavy for the analog astronauts. Um, yeah, th there are many different uh, um, criteria that are taken into account. Yeah, well, you need to find the right balance, right? Exactly, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so according to would you like to take the other question? Uh, yeah, so we have a second question, uh, this time by Chris, uh, who's asking how many volunteers uh, you need on average to, to organize the missions. Um, and he's asking whether it's just a crew you introduced or whether there are more people in the background. Or... OK, so um, to organize uh, these missions, there are many, many volunteers. So um, during the mission, usually in the, uh, we rotate a little bit in the um, uh, mission support uh, center. Um, yeah, so in during the mission, let's say we are maximum about 30 people, if I remember correctly from the last mission. And then, uh, um, yeah, but rotating in the end, it's a lot of people if the mission lasts one month. Um, then in the field, there's not only the analog astronauts. In the next mission, there will be six uh, participating as analog astronauts. There will be also uh, some support, uh, another support uh, team, um, which is uh, also composed by approximately 10 people, if uh, I'm not wrong. And yeah, there is another uh, follow-up question from Chris. Uh, so if it's something you can comment on what uh, the budget of such a desert analog mission would be. Okay. Um, I don't have the exact numbers for, for this and yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, in general, these missions are supported by uh, our sponsors or um, with the in-kind uh, contributions from companies and uh, from or other organizations. And yeah, this is what I can say. <laughs> and Laura, have you always stayed in, in, um, in Vienna during the mission, so you managed to go <laughs> to one of these play cool places? Where <laughs> so you didn't listen uh, very well, Chiara. The mission support center is in Innsbruck. <laughs> So yeah, so, yeah uh, in, in Austria, basically. You yeah, in Austria. Uh, I was not uh, participating in the mission from the field, <laughs> only from the mission support center so far. Perfect. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I guess someone from the Austrian. Yeah, uh, thanks Willy. a lot. <laughs> Willy <laughs> is uh, our president thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay so i don't see other questions in the chat uh Lara, it was a really interesting presentation um yeah so thanks a lot for for accept, accepting our invitation for being with us and yeah we look forward to know more about future missions so yeah we'll contact you in the future to know <laughs> how, how it went <laughs> thanks a lot for the invitation and I'm very happy. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.